day. This meeting is being recorded. So uh, we are planning on using this meeting, not only today, but we'll continue to use it. You'll be able to, to go back and reference it uh, if necessary this summer. Uh, but what we wanted to do was to get together as a group with all of the all of our uh, partners that we have here in the state who work in disaster preparedness, uh, talk to everyone about what what rich. Let me step back a minute. My name is Robin Harris. I'm associate counsel with Texas Realtors. Thank you for joining us. We wanted to have this meeting so that we can talk about all of these uh, resources that are available to. Uh, not only are Realtor members to Realtor clients, uh, to insurance professionals, to uh, uh, homeowners, to everyone who's out there right now, renters, uh, things that you can do when disaster strikes. So, for example, winter storm, hurricane, uh, severe weather, like we're having in some areas around the state right now, just everything. We're not specifically focused on hurricane, but just so happens hurricane season started yesterday. Uh, so it's the perfect time, right? So without further ado, like I said, we had a lot, have a lot uh, to get through today. So I'm going to start with our first panelist, uh, Gilbert Heron. He's with FEMA. So Gil, I'm gonna let you go ahead and introduce yourself and what it is that you do. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for attending. My name is Gilbert Giron. I'm the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison for FEMA to Region 6. It's my primary responsibility to be the liaison between our insured customers in a five-state region and any issues they may have with the flood insurance policy that they had. Either it be they're paying too high of a premium, um, partial denial of claims, or full out the denial of flood insurance claims. If they have any questions or concerns, they can contact my office. Now would be the one to try to come to a uh, satisfactory resolution before we up the uh, request to the headquarters level. So thanks, Gil. I wanted to talk to you about, uh, like I said, insurance, uh, uh, flood insurance specifically is, is something that, that y'all are focused on through your office. It, it comes into play uh, really often but I, I wanna talk specifically about hurricanes since, since we're coming into hurricane season. So what is it when, uh, when a homeowner or a, a broker or agent is working with a client and there's a storm that develops in the Gulf, they don't have flood insurance, uh, they don't have uh, other kinds of insurance for their home, is it too late to get insurance at that point? Actually, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, normally, there is a 30-day wait when it comes to buying a flood insurance policy through the NFIP. Uh, that means if you own your house already, you decide you want flood insurance, you contact your insurance provider. As new business, there will be a 30-day wait. However, there is an exception that we want real estate professionals to understand this. At times of closing, that 30-day wait can be waived and coverage could be immediately available to provide a protection for those new homeowners. And we encourage that, especially if the existing homeowner had a policy that has some type of grandfathering benefit, that can be assigned or rolled over to the new homeowner. But on average, if this is new business, there is a 30-day wait, and that can't be waived. So that's something that has to be you know, kept in mind. Hurricane season already started. You never know when an event's going to be off the coast. If uh, you are signed up for flood insurance, an event hits before that 30-day period, it will not constitute coverage. So it's imperative to keep in mind. Uh, if you're closing on a new home, you're refinancing on your existing one, that 30 day waiting period can be waived. But those are the only exceptions. So, but Gil, why is it important to have flood insurance? Well, it, well, first off, flood insurance is a single peril policy. It only covers damages for flood. Uh, your standard homeowner's insurance will not cover flood. In fact, unless you specifically had a separate rider, it won't even come close to touching. Now, it's important we understand flooding is going to be from an external source coming in. It's not going to be a water break inside of your house. That's going to be standard homeowner's insurance. But for the uh, peril of flooding, it's a single peril policy, and it is not included on the standard homeowner's insurance. And that's so important for people to understand. 
all the risks involved with where they live, either it be just their standard homeowner's insurance, flood insurance, or even if they elevate their home high enough, the wind could be an, another factor and having a wind insurance as well. Is there a difference between, uh, speaking on, keeping on this, on this flood insurance, is there a difference between just regular rising water from a, a levee breaking or, or river overflowing compared to wind-driven rain? What's the, what's the difference there? That's a great question. Well, your house should be in a good state of repair. Uh, we do have flood insurance that will cover replacement cost value as well as um, uh, actual cash value. Uh, the thing about your homes, if they are not in a good state of repair and they're not able to uh, act in accordance with what they were designed with, such as wind-driven rain coming in from an angle, uh, that is not a flooding event in FEMA's eyes. It will not be covered under the flood insurance. The flood insurance is normally going to be some type of coastal riverine type of flooding event coming in, uh, you know, um, incredibly um, high amounts of rain, such as the 52 inches we saw in Hurricane Harvey. Uh, but wind driven rain normally happens when we have an, a home of um, an, a disrepair and the seals of the windows, the windows are not doing their job and they're letting water come in. So that is excluded from what is covered under the standard flood insurance policy. So I'm going to take this opportunity to shift while we're talking about the wind storm, the, the wind driven rain. I'm going to shift to David Lawson. We have David Lawson with uh, Twia Texas Windstorm Insurance Association. David, go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, wind driven rain issue. Absolutely. Uh, and just real quick, my name is David Lawson. Uh, I am the business continuity and catastrophe plan analyst for the uh, the associations. Basically, I'm responsible for uh, planning for when things go boom. Uh, I also do our uh, public outreach and outreach with our partners at the emergency management um, areas from you know city, county, all the way up to the, the federal folks. Um, so yeah, and you know when we talk about wind-driven rain, um, there is definitely going to be those instance, instances where you know probably a 20-year-old, 25, 30-year shingle could be subject to, you know, those 30, 35, 40 mile an hour wind gusts, lifting that up. Um, a lot of the times when you get an older shingle, that seal strip might be a little bit compromised, which doesn't necessarily uh, constitute damage. But when that wind is kind of elevated to the point where we can lift up those things, and mind you, we also have uh, roof vents up there. We have areas where that that rain can get in only at a certain angle and only at those elevated wind speeds. Um, when it comes to coverage with Texas Windstorm in particular, uh, there is uh, an addition that you can put on your policy, something that we call an endorsement that is specifically for wind-driven rain. It is not part of the base policy for Texas Windstorm. There has to be first that wind-created opening. But in the absence of that wind created opening, if you have this addition to your policy, um, and it, it is for a little bit more premium, uh, then you would be covered from those instances where you know it comes through the window seal, or it comes through uh, maybe some lifted shingles in some of the areas. So there are opportunities for that to be covered, and it's not necessarily going to be uh, due to disrepair or old things. Um, you know, when we get these these torrential downpours and especially these spring squall lines. Um, you know, I'm, I started leaking uh, in, my, in my laundry room just the other day here in Austin uh, when we had those big, big uh, flash flooding rains. And so that is going to be something that is very possible um, and is, is covered if you have that, that addendum. Uh, and, and I'll go into this a little bit later on in, in my portion, but that's why it's so important for our policyholders to be working with their agents, their, their insurance agents, to ensure that those sorts of damages and those sorts of scenarios are played out and you can kind of do that cost benefit analysis to, to whether or not that increase in premium is going to, to, to outweigh uh, what you would see from, from the coverage. But, and, and so, so yeah, thanks for adding that, but and this is, this is it, David, this is your, this is your portion. So, oh, we're okay. into it. so <laughs> but first let me ask you, I, you know, I'm from El Paso. It gets really windy in El Paso. Does TWIA, can I get a TWIA policy out there or, or Abilene? What, what's, what's going on with TWIA? Yeah, so uh, Texas Windstorm Insurance Association is only um, available to residents uh, in the 14 coastal counties in Harris County, a little sliver just east of 146 there around the port, uh, you know, that area just right up there, kind of that little nook 
uh, in the Houston Ship Channel. Um, and so those are, you know, back in 1971, I don't want to get too historical on you, but uh, back in 1971, after Hurricane Celia came through the Corpus area, a lot of the private insurers decided this is not something that we are willing to do. And we're not going to be providing that wind and hail coverage for this, the Texas coast. Obviously, this is something that is a yearly occurrence. Uh, if it's not a hurricane, it's a hailstorm or a tornado or something like that. Uh, so we were put in place by the Texas legislature to act as a nonprofit organization uh, that provides that residual market for those two perils, wind and hail. And so this is very much a coastal issue um, and is not something that a lot of the, the other parts of Texas um, you know, have to deal with. You know, up in Abilene, up in the Panhandle, even up in North Texas, you're going to find those, uh, those big wind storms, those big straight line winds associated with your spring and fall storms. But it's not at the same rate and it's not the same types of perils as a hurricane is going to bring. Um, and so that's why those, those private insurers decided that it is not uh, sustainable for them to provide that coverage, which is where we come in. Um, and, and so this is, you know, especially for, for folks coming in, and these areas are seeing big growth. Um, you know, the, the Houston area, and especially Nueces County, is seeing a lot of growth and a lot of folks coming in from outside of the area. And if you are just coming in as your standard normal homeowner who only interacts with insurance, when you get your, um, you know, your mortgage papers for every year and you see what's in the escrow, and that's what you're paying. And that's probably going to be the extent to your interaction with your insurance company. And so, and when I'm speaking to realtors, especially, this is why that interaction, when you're first talking to, to somebody who's moving to the area and you're walking through, you're talking about the particulars of this community, it's so important to, to at least understand that Texas Windstorm is a standalone separate entity that they're going to have to figure out whether or not they're going to need to, to engage with. Um, there are private insurers that write wind and hail coverage on the Texas coast right now today. Um, and we encourage, and that is actually part of the eligibility process um, for homeowners to go out and shop. Go see if you know, um, you know, your, your state farm or somebody like that is going to write your coverage. Uh, part of the eligibility requirements for us is that a homeowner has one declination from a private insurer prior to becoming eligible for Texas Windstorm. Um, and so this is where that, that uh, kind of buyer or even talking to the seller about it, um, you know, this is such a, an important uh, interaction with a homeowner. And when you're talking about either a new Texan or somebody coming in from out of the area, um, you know, you guys can be that first bulwark. Uh, against some decisions that could lead to, to them losing out on a whole pile of money on the back end. Wait, so, so that's a roundabout would, way of, of telling you it's the 14 coastal counties. Yeah, per, no, that's perfect. And how would, how would a home buyer know if their home is eligible for, for insurance through the association? Yeah, so when you're going out and you're shopping for your homeowner's policy, like you would if you were buying a home in Arlington or Amarillo, um, then, you know, when you go to your USAA and you put in for that application for, for your homeowner's insurance, they're going to decline you coverage for those, uh, for those uh, pieces of, uh, or those, uh, I'm sorry, for those hazards, for those risks. Um, and so that is the declination that is the indication to you as, as the homeowner that I need to go to Texas Windstorm. Um, so this is going to be something that is more or less self-evident uh, because of the fact that you are not able to go out to a private insurer, your standard homeowner's insurer, and they're still going to provide you that homeowner's policy for liability, um, you know, vandalism and malicious mischief, um, and, and some of those other things, and possibly even the, the flooding from bursted pipes and things like that. However, you will very quickly find out if you're buying something in Palacios or if you're buying something, uh, you know, down in Port Mansfield, um, it's likely that you will run into to a company that's going to decline you. And that is where working with your insurance agent, they're likely going to understand that this is the time that we need to go back over to Texas Windstorm and see, see if there's other ways. Um, there's also ways for current Texas Windstorm insurance folks to, to see if there are private market solutions. Um, we have a depopulation program. Uh, where we go out and uh, agents are able to, to kind of see whether or not there are policies out there for their policyholders to, to go out and get that would provide them with that whole homeowner's policy that includes windstorm and hail. Um, and even if 
you know, in the absence of that depopulation uh, policy, you can go out uh, and have that discussion. There are lots of folks who can see benefits from going out and having a discussion with a private insurance company. Uh, and it's not our job to, to hinder you or prevent you from doing that. And so it's really important that you have that open, honest communication, A, at the front end of that transaction and understanding the, the circumstances and the environment that you're at in that local community. Uh, but then going out uh, with the insurance uh, provider and the insurance agent and really talking through what this is going to look like for you as a homeowner. Because for a lot of these folks, we're talking about three separate policies three separate premiums and three different ways to go about paying that premium, which can be an absolute killer for folks um, who are really just kind of starting out. Yeah, it, it, it's a lot to keep track of, it sounds like. What is, what's TWIA doing to get ready for this hurricane season coming up? So obviously uh, 2020 was one of the most active seasons that we've seen in quite some time. Um, and right now, one of the things that we're really trying to focus in on is looking at homeowners and businesses, because uh, we also do provide commercial uh, coverage, uh, that sustained damage from last year. And one of the things that's important to know going into the, the next season where it is very likely that we're going to see that same setup that can provide the, the big number of storms that we saw. And it's just a matter of time to when that makes its way to Texas. Um, and, and so the, the biggest thing that we're doing there is trying to encourage those policyholders and those uh, folks who had claims in the past, get that work done. Um, you know, if you have the ability to, I know that the, uh, you know, the cost of treated lumber OSB board and almost every type of um, building material has increased markedly over the past year, but it is one of the things that we can't do is we can't pay for damage twice. So if in 2020, uh, you sustain damage. And let's say maybe half your roof needed to be replaced and we covered that. Let's say that we have another storm this summer and you have a whole roof replacement that needs to be done after the damage from that. Well, that first half that we paid for that hasn't been addressed, that hasn't been covered, um, we're not going to pay for that a second time as per the policy. We can only pay for damage one time. And so this is why we're really trying to encourage folks where possible, get that work done. Um, you know, if you're in the process of getting your WPIH and things like that, there's definitely some case by case um, things that we can look at, but that is one of the focuses that we have uh, for this storm season. And then internally, you know, we are a 200 person organization, uh, fairly small by the, the number of policies that we have. But when we go from the 200 person organization to needing to respond to a Hurricane Harvey, or even worse than that, we're looking at you know, onboarding thousands of employees. And so a lot of what we're doing from the end of storm season up until now is putting in place the processes, the technology to facilitate that. So that's been a lot of our focus is kind of internally putting in the pieces to ensure that we can get to people within those first two weeks. Those first two weeks after a storm are so pivotal in getting the process moving, getting money into people's hands and having those folks begin to either mitigate their damages or begin the process of repairs. Um, so that's definitely the, the biggest thing for us right now is going out to policyholders and encouraging them, get that work done. We're looking at another active season and then making sure that people know that we are internally prepared. Our mobile claim centers are set up to account for uh, the, the safety standards in place. Uh, and, and will be available as they would have been in every other year past. Um, but that's definitely our, our focus and our message going out to, to the policyholders this year. That's great. I, you know, I, I wanna shift a little bit now and, and just kind of follow the process of, of home buying specifically. It's, it's similar to, to commercial. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift a little bit. We have uh, Sidra Goldwater from Fannie Mae uh, so if, if you would go ahead and, and just kind of introduce yourself and, and who you are, what you do, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about AMA and, and the lending process and how it relates to disaster preparedness and recovery. Sure. So my name is Sidra Goldwater. I'm on Fannie Mae's disaster rebuild and recovery team. We're basically... Uh, Fannie Mae's boots on the ground. Uh, we were, were a fairly new team. We were started in uh, 2019 after Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, really as a response to the growing number of disasters impacting communities. Um, 
But we, as folks may or may know, Fannie Mae is the largest investor in mortgages in the country. On the single family side, we own one in four mortgages. Um, and we, on the multifamily side, own about a comparable number of multifamily or invest in a, compar a comparable number of multifamily units. So that's, that's really interesting because you, you say that your team was just started in 2019. There's probably a lot of people who don't realize that Fannie Mae has, uh, has this group uh, and, and these, some of these programs available. So, so if, if a, an agent has a buyer and they're in the process of, you know, they put the contract down, they're processing, lenders processing a loan uh, and, uh, what does Fannie Mae or does Fannie Mae have any sort of role at that point when the transaction has, has not closed and a disaster comes in? Sure. So one of the key things is, you know, we rely on lenders. We, we call it a rep and warrant model. Obviously, we can't check every property, every contract. We rely on our lenders to make sure that, you know, everything is, is, is as it, it is supposed to be when it's delivered to us. Um, and so what that means is one of the things that we require the lender to warrant is that the property is not damaged. Now, that being said, um, if a, you know, after, uh, depending on where you are, you may get the appraisal after the disaster event happens, and then it's all well and good because, you know, the appraiser has seen the property, knows it's not damaged, has established the value. But there's that period where uh, in between, say, the appraisal may have been completed and your loan closes. And so in that instance, the lender needs to make a determination um, whether or not the property has been damaged. And that could be done through an inspection. They may make a determination that a new appraisal is warranted. Um, and that's to uh, make a determination if the property is damaged and still can be delivered. Now, if the property is damaged, uh, there are sort of two routes. One is, is the damage insured? And if the damage is insured, then the lender may deliver it to Fannie Mae if the insurance proceeds are enough to repair the property. So they need to collect information on, you know, uh, how much the repairs will cost, what your insurance proceeds are. And it's basically, they want to make sure that, you know, the property, in addition to that, they want to make sure that, you know, the safety and soundness of the property hasn't been impacted. So if the property were to be, say, completely, um, burnt to the ground, obviously that's a set, a set of circumstances that that could not be delivered to us. But if there was, you know, minor damage to the roof, things like that, those loans may be able to be delivered to us depending on if there's enough insurance proceeds to cover the damage. Now, if the property was not insured in that set of circumstances, the lender cannot deliver the loan to Fannie Mae until that property has been repaired. So, and so in addition to, uh, to working on that, are there any specific programs or assistance that you have for, for homeowners, for, for buyers that are in the process, either, either in the process of purchasing or even after purchasing and Fannie Mae owns that loan? Sure. So I would, uh, you know, direct folks to our, um, you know, consumer facing website. We have a website called knowyouroptions.com. And on that website is a ton of information about the closing process, about what happens if a loan, uh, if you do experience, uh, you know, a disaster, how insurance proceeds work, what are the workout options. It is a plethora of information and I'm not even, you know, T you know, touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of the information that's available. Um, but one of the things that we also have available is our disaster response network. And this again is um, our largest program that my team has set up. Um, it was, you know, set up basically because we saw that there was a need to sort of help um, homeowners and renters sort of navigate through the disaster recovery process. Because we all know it's a, a myriad of uh, agencies, many of whom are on here, but trying to understand what insurance proceeds cover, what the SBA covers, what FEMA covers, how to apply for all those aids is non-intuitive. So we set up the disaster response network and it's staffed by HUD approved counselors. And if you have a Fannie Mae 
loan or you're in a Fannie Mae uh, property, uh, a renter, this is a free service. Um, there's no charge to you. And it's, we provide up to 18 months of counseling. Um, and I'll just, uh, I can uh, include the number for the DRN in the chat, but the number is 877-833-1746. And I think our, our chat right now isn't going out. Oh to everyone I think right. the chat was the chat was disabled but we do have the uh the question and answer portion open so i would encourage people uh if you have any questions as we're moving forward um we still have several panelists to to talk with but if you have any questions please go ahead and, and put that in sidra can you give us that phone number one more time sure it's 877-833 one seven four six. You can also find it if you go to knowyouroptions.com and uh, sort of on that page, Google Disaster Response Network. Thanks. And the the uh, this webinar, like I said at the beginning, it is being recorded. Uh, we're not going to be sending it out specifically to all of the attendees, but. We are recording, it'll be available on our website to watch at a later time. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, when disaster has actually, has actually hit. And, and we have some people from TDI, we'll, we'll get to what happens before disaster strikes and, and what you need. Uh, we have Chris Lopez from the Texas General Land Office. Uh, so, Krista, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself and, and what it is that y'all do at your organization. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Krista Lopez, and I work for the Texas General Land Office. Um, we are the oldest state agency in Texas and probably have one of the more confusing portfolios as well. Um, specifically, the area I work with um, is the Community Development and Revitalization Unit. That's a mouthful. Um, we do disaster recovery. Um, the majority of the work that we do in disaster recovery for the state of Texas um, comes from funding from uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. Um, most people are familiar with HUD programs, whether it be Section 8 housing or some other regular entitlement programs. Those are run by other state agencies. But when it comes to HUD's funding for disaster recovery, that's where our agency comes into play. So we work with um, individual households um, who may have been affected by a disaster. Uh, if there's a, a congressional appropriation for disaster recovery funds, then we work with individual households on um, home repair and or replacement. Um, we have a homeowner's reimbursement program that we often also support. And then we also work with individual uh, businesses, as well as individual communities and jurisdictions on rebuilding infrastructure. So I find it very confusing that the General Land Office is in charge of things like the Alamo and all these properties around the state, and they also provide disaster insurance. I don't know if, if it's like a railroad commission type of thing that has nothing to do with the railroad, right? You got it. You got it, right? So, um, yeah. So yeah, talk talk a little bit more. I mean, are, are there any specific programs, or or what can a what can where can a where can a realtor direct their clients if disaster strikes, uh, and and why the GLO as opposed to one of the other organizations? Sure. Um, and and to caveat, I used to work for Texas Division of Emergency Management, and so I I've spent a lot of time working with individual homeowners on disaster recovery. And, and most often the Division of Emergency Management is where folks believe they should go. And it is the first line for information related to emergencies and disasters. Um, when there is a federal appropriation from HUD or from Congress through HUD, um, those funds come to the Texas General Land Office. Um, we have a coastal division. It's also one of our um, areas of specialty in the General Land Office. And they take care of the entire coastline of Texas all mitigation activities, uh, three miles out to the ocean, uh, to the Gulf. And so um, one of the special hats that Governor Perry, uh, when he was in office, decided the GLO should take on is the disaster recovery arm. So that's how we landed with it. Um, and as far as for the realtors um, on the call, I think it's important to know 
when individual homeowners have a disaster, um, we do get funds, but our funds come through a congressional appropriation. So I always say it takes an act of Congress and it takes that long. Um, so it could be two or three years after a disaster by the time we actually get our funding. Um, and we support homeowners who still have an unmet need. Um, so for example, they may still have a home loan. They may still have a loan from SBA. They may have received assistance from FEMA. Um, we are looking at all the things that they have already received to see if there's any duplication of effort. And if, if there is, then we can't serve them in particular areas, but if there's still an unmet need and there's not a duplication of benefits uh, assessed, then we may be able to assist them, as I mentioned, in rebuilding their house or um, doing a brand new construction. This gets complicated for homeowners, right? So if they had a house that was a five bedroom, um, under the HUD rules, we provide them based on their uh, current status in their home, so current household members. So we may only be able to provide them a three bedroom house, right? Mm -hmm. So that may change the value of the home or the style of the home. It may also impact the overall jurisdiction's values of their homes, correct? Because we're now shifting the dynamics and, and the look, but we're also trying to prevent that blight that may occur in communities where individuals don't have money to rebuild their homes. Um, and so that may also change the tax base and the value within those communities. So we're able to offset and support um, our primary focus because we are HUD funded is low to moderate uh, income households. And so we look at each jurisdiction that's eligible and we target those areas, but it doesn't mean they're the only ones that we serve. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we're also able to do a reimbursement program. So we've had households that have put their own money or maybe they've taken a secondary um, mortgage or they've taken a personal loan out to rebuild their house. We may be able to provide them reimbursement up to $50,000 for those out-of-pocket costs um, to rebuild that they've already done in rebuilding their house because maybe they've chosen to do it on their own before our funding became available. So we have multiple options out there, um, but we always say insurance is the best effort first. Um, okay. Making sure that homes are properly insured because we're not guaranteed. Um, FEMA may declare a disaster, but HUD may not get a federal appropriation. So we may not come along, or as I mentioned, it might take two to three years for us to come along and assist. So I hate for folks to think that they are you know, going to wait on disaster assistance from the federal government and through the states, but the best line of defense is being properly insured. Um, and that's not just for homeowners, but for those of you who represent renters out there, Rob and I were talking about this earlier, renters can um, apply for the NFIP program, they can get flood insurance. And so educating those tenants about what they're eligible for as well is important. Oh, that's, that's perfect. That leads me right into the difference. We've talked a little bit about the aid and we can talk about the insurance portion of it. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, Felicia Rivers from Texas Department of Insurance. Felicia, are you still with us? There we go. Watching and taking notes just like everyone else, right? A lot of good information. Um, so if, if you would, Felicia, go ahead, introduce yourself to, to everyone and, and just what you do there with TDI. Hello, I am Felicia Rivers with the Texas Department of Insurance. I am a project manager and more specifically, one of my working titles is a disaster coordinator. Uh, I work in the customer operations section and that's the section that pretty much um, takes in a lot of the calls uh, after a disaster and sometimes even before a disaster. Um, but the Texas Department of Insurance is a state government agency that regulates the insurance industry here in Texas. And one of our, one of our roles is just making sure that um, policyholders or consumers of Texas are being um, treated fairly um, by their insurance companies. So I, I wanna ask going back to uh, in the process of a, of a home sale transaction before the home is closed. What are the recommendations for coverage? Is, is coverage required for that home buyer, for the home seller, and the, the transition once the sale has closed? 
So one of the things that um, is important or that we advise consumers that say may be in the process of purchasing a home is um, usually the lender will require uh, you to be able to bind the uh, insurance on the property. So we always say, don't delay, you know, buying today um, because you, you never know when maybe in the process of you purchasing a home, a disaster may occur. So if there's a binder on, on the property, then you should be uh, taken care of by that insurer who is binding the property for you. And so what about uh, one of the provisions in the TREC contract relates specifically to casualty loss, damage to a home due to a, a hurricane or a, a severe weather event? Is that generally considered casualty loss within the within a, a homeowner's policy? policy. Yes, the, usually that's excluded. <laughs> um, usually that's, that's there, there are, it's important to, uh oh, I hear someone, I'm sorry. Um, it's important to uh, know like what your policy covers, but then also look at the exclusions. And usually in the exclusion portion of the policy, it's going to outline things like a hurricane. So agents and brokers working with their, with their clients can direct people specifically to those portions of the, of the policy in of case the policy. there's a, an event. Yes, I mean, and, and that also goes for like uh, water coverage too. Is there an exclusion in your policy? Um, so oftentimes, I mean, policies vary uh, about the type of coverage. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you have water coverage. So now uh, in, the in the exclusion of a policy contract, um, it, it'll give you specifics of what is covered and what is actually excluded. So for example, if you start having flooding from, um, uh, let's say like like they say rising water for you know for example um, flood is not covered by a homeowner's policy but if you have water coverage then um, and you have say like damage to uh, your pipes but if that's due to a hurricane then you see how there could be some exclusion there would be exclusion there so it would be important to look at both what your policy is covering and what the exclusions are. And we talked a little bit about uh, binding the policy on, a, on an existing property. What about new construction? There are a lot of new homes going up. And so you get under contract with a builder. What, uh, what are some of the things that can be communicated to buyers of, of new construction properties? Um, so I would like to um, introduce at this time, my um, colleague, uh, Douglas Klopfenstein. Uh, he is one of our um, specialists um, in windstorm inspectors and is very, very um, well versed in this particular um, part of covering uh, homes. So Good afternoon. Would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, yeah. New construction. If it's a new construction, there's houses going up all over the state. So on a new construction, what... Uh, what can agents and brokers advise their, their buyers on what type of insurance to be looking for pre, you know, in, in that, in that pre-closing time when you're under contract and it's still being built? Well, I understand when they build homes that they have to have a builder's risk policy and they want to maintain that until uh, they sell the house. And, um, I'm not too sure if or how the wind part, part of it is covered. Maybe maybe David Lawson could help with that. But uh, yeah, they do have to have a builder's risk policy during the phase of construction. And to my the, understanding of it is they use. Yes. OK, just just now my understanding. My, OK, yeah, my understanding of it also is, is it's sometime during the early phases of construction, sometime during the foundation work or maybe while the walls are being framed up is when they purchase that. Okay. And David, does that include windstorm 
Yeah, so uh, Texas Windstorm uh, does have, it's a commercial policy. So this is uh, separate from a homeowner's policy and it's gonna be different, but it's called, just like y'all were talking about, the builder's risk policy. Um, and there are different levels of coverage that are associated with that. But again, the placement of that coverage is going to be through that insurance agent. And obviously, if it is uh, on the TWIA side, that's still required to, to receive that one declination from a, a private insurer. Uh, but a lot of the builders that would be building down um, you know, on Galveston Island, like Jackson, et cetera, um, I, I would assume that they would understand how that process works. But in case not, uh, that is definitely available through our commercial policy. We also got a question, and I don't know, uh, Felicia, if uh, uh, you or, or Doug would be best to answer about after a hailstorm when sellers just want to assign the proceeds uh, mm -hmm. to buyers instead of actually doing the repairs. But the casualty loss section of the TREC contract provides an option for assignment of proceeds. But most insurance companies uh, or insurance policies have anti assignment provisions. So is, is there a way to reconcile those or, or uh, any thoughts on that? And Camille, we haven't spoken with you yet, but uh, with the Insurance Council, if you have any thoughts as well. I don't wanna over talk. No, that's okay. This is one of those where I just throw it out there and I probably should have been a little bit more direct on it. But, <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but, but yeah, question from, uh, from one of our viewers. Okay. Go ahead, Felicia. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. So you're right. Most insurance companies, they, they don't allow um, that. I mean, the way that the insurance company is going to view uh, that situation or one of the reasons why they probably don't allow that um, is because their insured is the policyholder, the, the homeowner, um, not the person that they're wanting to transfer that to. Um, and then also in the policy contract, um, it'll explain to you or it'll explain to the policyholder, whoever's viewing it. Um, here are the responsibilities of the insurer, which is the insurance company. And then here are the responsibilities of the policyholder. And with, within those two, that is a contractual agreement between the insurance carrier and the policyholder, not a third party. So all that language in there is, is binding for the two entities that have entered into the policy contract, the insurance carrier and the policyholder. I think you summed it up very nicely there, Felicia. And, and Robin, to add to that, you know, it, it is a contract. It is a contract between those two entities, as Felicia points out. And, I, you know, I don't know about, about y'all, but, you know, you drive down a street and you see so many um, roof repair companies um, and houses that are about about ready to sell. You know, they have the for sale sign up front and roofers are there doing their, their business. And part of that is as well is, yes, I'm sure, you know, the, the roof is, is damaged. And before that, that sale closes, there's so many times that that mortgage company and the next whoever is insuring that house is going to want to see that house in good condition. So, you know, if they are filing that claim, and um, the mortgage closes and the, the house has not been repaired. There's so many issues that can fall back on and now the new owner. And certainly the next insurance company that's gonna come in and write that policy is going to see that damage has already been addressed, has already been paid for, because as I think David talked about earlier, you know, we're not going to want to pay a second time for damage that had already been paid for, but not completed in its, in its time frame. So, and thanks Camille, we, we kind of sure. got you in there without a, a proper introduction. So why don't you take a minute and just uh, introduce yourself to everyone and what it is you do Absolutely. there with the Insurance Council. Sure, um, and, and good afternoon everyone. And thank you for allowing me to be in part of this wonderful group. I'm, I'm the Director of Communications and Public Affairs with the Insurance Council of Texas or um, known as ICT. We're a, a nonprofit trade association representing um, over 400 property and casualty insurance companies here who write about 78% of PNC business here in the state of Texas. 
Um, so happy to be here. And from my role, um, certainly I, I work with a lot of, um, not only from a communication standpoint with our member companies, but also um, being the media spokesperson as well. So let me ask then, because you, you would have a good perspective on here, the, the insurance market in Texas is, is, I mean, it's different from other places, right? I can say different. Yes. Um, so how, how does it compare to other places? Why is it, why do things cost more here when it comes to insurance compared to other places? Yeah, you know, I, I, I love that, um, you know, we are, everything's bigger in Texas, everything's bigger in Texas. And so when we talk about all the factors that go into the cost of insurance, it really, so much of it boils down to um, the severity of our events and the catastrophes that happen here in this state. We're number one in hail losses in the nation. We just had um, the latest data and from 2019 showed that we had 870 ha major hail losses in the state. And the next closest state was the state of Kansas with only 540 events. We're number four in lightning losses. We're number one in storm surge losses. Our severe weather reports, according to NOAA, we had in 2019 between hail, wind and, and hurricanes, almost 2000 events. And again, state the state of Texas was a uh, state of Kansas was the next number two with fourteen hundred events. So that in and of itself hopefully um, helps people understand the severity of our losses and how expensive it is to write business here and to maintain that kind of um, that financial um, solvency in the state in order to really you know go forward and write that. We are from a um, from a homeowner's rates perspective, we're actually number three. So we're right behind Florida and Oklahoma and Oklahoma and Louisiana are kind of almost neck and neck right now, but we're behind those two major states. And obviously Florida and Oklahoma have their fair share of um, significant shares of, of uh, uh, significant cata catastrophic events. So being number three, we actually average about thirty four about a $3,400 um, in is the national is the Texas average for a, a homeowner's policy. Take into consideration and anecdotally, I came from Dallas not not two years ago. And Dallas, my homeowner's policy was thirty two hundred dollars, and I, I came to Austin, brand new home, and it was twelve hundred dollars. So really, your area of risk, the propensity for the risk, and your exposure really has so much to do with it. The the the, your construction costs has so much to, to do with it. And as we're seeing construction costs now, the cost of labor, that also factors in to the, the weather events that we're having here. Well, so let me ask you, you make a, a good point about the construction cost. When a claim is made on, on a, for a property and the insurance adjuster comes in with their price for repairs, but it is, uh, I mean, the value of the, of the property is, much, much higher. We've seen values go up and up and up. Mm -hmm. So what is it that insurance companies are looking for uh, when, it's, when it comes to that repair value versus construction or, or just the, the cost of repairs? You're right. You're, you're from, a, from an insurance standpoint, we're not necessarily looking at market value or appraisal value. So right now the market is booming. Boy, you know, I'm certainly talking to the, you know, the choir here. Market is booming, market's tight, you know, the housing is just, you know, flying off the shelves. So that appraisal value doesn't necessarily mean that that's how much it's going to cost to rebuild your house. So take into consideration cost to rebuild versus appraisal, cost to rebuild, not the cost of the land plus the house. Um, so take that all into consideration. If you insure to appraisal value, you might be overinsured. If if in other if in other um, times in you know 20 years ago, if you insured to appraisal value, you might have been underinsured. So really look at all factors as far as cost is concerned in order to what's it going to take to rebuild my house. One other one other aspect that I think is also critically important as you look at this. Some people just kind of roll the dice and they say, you know what, um, I'm never going to have a total loss. And, you know, I knock on wood as I say that, but never going to have a total loss. So, you know what, I'm not going to insure my house for the total value. Um, if you own your house free and clear, 
one of the issues that could potentially happen if you do have a total loss is that your insurance company is going to say, you know what, you never insured this properly. And so we're going to have to calculate a pro rata as far as what we're paying for the, the damage to this house. You should have, for example, um, insured it for 100,000, you insured it for only 50,000. So we're only going to give you 50% of the cost of this because you should have been paying these premiums for a $100,000 value. So, so keep that in mind because unfortunately, as, as folks are, are you know owning their home free and clear, there's those kinds of decisions that need to be made. And sometimes you know until we are in a position where it's unfortunate um, to ask about our policy and the ramifications of some of those kinds of decisions, those types of decisions can really play a significant factor in your ultimate payout. And, and I appreciate that. That's a good point about people not having the, not always fully insuring their property. And I want to, if I can, bring it back to Gil, who we, who we started with at the beginning of the hour with, with hurricane season, flood season, severe storms going on. A lot of people will advertise their home when they list it, right? Not in a flood zone uh, or flood insurance not required. So tell me, uh, you know, tell me about that from a, from a floodplain management perspective. What's the problem with advertising your property that way? It's important to remember. And I, when I do presentations, I ask uh, my audience if they live in a floodplain to raise their hands. And I often get a handful. And then the eyes really open up when I tell them the entire country is a floodplain. It's just a question of what risk you live in. Uh, and then I throw examples out there and I'll do it now. My very first disaster, Oklahoma, 4222 in 2015, 65% of the damaged structures were outside of what FEMA calls the high risk flood zones. So and another thing is on FEMA maps, our flood insurance rate maps, at no time will you ever find any place that FEMA says this area will not flood. Simply not the case. The entire country is a floodplain. You just live in areas of minimal flooding as opposed to higher flood risks. So knowing that, the decision to provide a, um, a, a level of protection through a flood insurance policy is, is really a no brainer. The question is what, how much can the homeowners afford? Uh, statutory limits for flood insurance through the NFIP is 250,000 for building, 100,000 for content. I often tell people, content, put your house in the palm of your hand, turn it upside down, shake it. Everything that falls out is your content. You will be surprised on the amount of content a house has. And most people cannot replace all of your content in one go. So without content insurance, totally on your own to replace your TVs, your couches, your dressers, your beds, et cetera, right? So can you really afford not to be protected by a flood insurance policy when we're fast approaching this hurricane season? Well, and, and what, I mean, why can't they just, why can't they just wait for, for example, call Sidra and, and get some some disaster assistance from from her group or Krista once that congressional mandate has come in why can't they just wait for the Department of Man Emergency Management to come in for that aid uh, to provide well first off is the event large enough to be declared a disaster second of all are these organizations going to receive additional funding to help offset disaster assistance and we're talking about an application process that can take weeks if not months even for FEMA disaster assistance, from the time the disaster is cleared, we are just now starting the apparatus that FEMA operates on, and it will take us weeks, if not months, to get disaster assistance payout to those who are applying for disaster assistance. So those are not a guarantee. They're, if they are available, they have to go through the process. Adjusters have to go out there and do inspections, and then you know, if the inspections uh, warranted some type of disaster assistance, money will be available. But we talked about the amounts. Disaster assistance uh, is just, I'll use the Hurricane Harvey, for example. The average flood insurance payout was over $118,000. The average disaster assistant, assistance payout was under $6,000. Which one are you going to be able to rebuild more with? That's a good point. Those numbers uh, are, are very different. Um, so the so the, the the flood maps there and there are a lot of there are a lot of places now you can get flood map information 
what is it that that buyers and, and realtors should be looking at when they're when they're putting offers in on homes, purchasing homes? Uh, is, is there any language that they need to avoid? Anything that raises a red flag? Should they just get their own maps and pull it up? No, actually, it's a very good question. FEMA offers a lot of uh, interactive products. Uh, you, can, you can look up Map Service Center. You can look up the National Flood Hazard Layer. You can look up uh, BLE, Base Level Engineer um, Viewer. These give a really good indication of where locations are in relations to FEMA identified special flood hazard areas. And, and don't let us scare real estate professionals into thinking that it's not a practical um, um, you know, it's not going to cancel a sale if the house is in the special flood hazard area. What the owner has to, or the prospective owner has to think of if they're buying or looking to buy inside of a special flood hazard area is the overall cost of maintaining flood insurance. Maybe mitigating this house. Elevation is king in flood insurance world. The higher your house is, the more money you're going to save. I encourage a three foot free board. That's where you're going to receive the maximum amount of savings on your flood insurance. We're talking about reducing flood insurance from thousands to hundreds by taking the three feet of some type of elevation uh, mitigation. Uh, but if there's one thing I can really get across is that remember that our firms or flood insurance rate maps are a snapshot of time, okay? At the time the maps are created is the best ground truth information we have available. Well, as with most things, over time, the ground truth can change. And the maps can change leading into wider special flood hazard areas. So this is important for those who are looking for houses that are close, but not quite in a special flood hazard area. There's nothing that can, you know, say 10, 15 years later that they're going to be remapped and now they will be inside the special flood hazard area. And that could have an impact because mortgage lenders are required um, to have what's called a mandatory purchase of flood insurance if federal dollars touch a mortgage. So Fannie Mae, Fannie Mac, VA, HUD, et cetera, if they use a conventional loan that's touched by federal dollars, mandatory purchase of flood insurance is a requirement. And in fact, some lenders, if their assets, and as we like to consider it, our homes, but in fact, until it's paid off, it's still an asset of the lenders. They could provide another layer of protection if they feel that the asset is close enough to a special flood hazard area, they can still require flood insurance. So that's, uh, this has been a lot of information. We have just a couple minutes left before we get back to the top of the hour. Uh, if there are any questions from the folks who are watching, now's the time to type those in to our question and answer uh, window while we have everybody here, because when you come back to watch this in, you know, in late July or August, when a storm's barreling off uh, the coast of Florida coming this way, we're not gonna have time to ask those specific questions. So, uh, or even tonight when a storm is barreling towards your house, if you live in central Texas uh, to watch out for. So um, I don't see anything coming through, but- uh, Robin, if I may. Yeah, please, please. If I may add something, I know that we are talking about flood and how things are when things get really wet. Well. Things can be dangerous when they get extremely dry as well. Um, as we saw, uh, as I heard Camille speaking, uh, Camille with ICT Insurance Council of Texas speaking about um, homes being underinsured, uh, the Texas Department of Insurance received many calls um, during the Bastrop disaster in 2011 uh, when there was like over 32,000 acres, you know, totally flattened by fire. Um, and so, Many of the people in that area were underinsured. Uh, many of them were in a county mutual um, type of policy uh, where they were allowed to um, not have to increase um, their coverage. Uh, oftentimes insurance carriers will come to you and say, okay, we think that based on what it would take to replace your home if you had a total loss at this time, this is what it would cost. We'd like to increase um, your, your dwelling uh, coverage. Many, many times policyholders will say, okay, I don't want to do that. And, and that's where they end up upside down uh, in, in a situation like that. If a disaster such as fire um, starts in one place and spreads tremendously. Can I ask you for a clarification on that? So an insurance company on their own, your policy holder will come to the, uh, or the, the company will come to the policy holder and, and, and make a recommendation. Make the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not up to, the homeowners or the policy purchasers to find that information out. They'll 
provide the information and give you what they think that it should be. So now, it, so now let me clarify, um, as a courtesy to their policyholders, insurance companies oftentimes will say, okay, based on the information that we have for your area, this is what it would cost to replace your home or to rebuild your home if you had a complete loss. So there's not anything that mandates them to do that, if that's the question at hand. Um, so it is, it is a courtesy to the policyholder. Um, there is still a responsibility for uh, the consumer uh, or an expectation for the consumer to have some knowledge um, and, and to be informed about what it takes to properly insure their property. So it's not a guarantee. There could be some. It's not a guarantee, right? It's not a guarantee. Exactly. It's not a but guarantee. Yeah, I, I always just say, pay attention. I know when people are calling our 1-800-252-3439, um, we always advise, pay attention to what's going on locally around you. Because if there is a lot of building going on, then back to what um, Camille with ICT was saying, there may be a shortage of materials, me meaning a demand, the demand is higher than the supply in your area for the type of home you had, for the types of materials that were required to, to build your home um, or that your home was built from, so. Perfect, well, that's that's a good point and a good, uh, uh, good point to end on. So I'd like to wrap up, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Don't forget, knowyouroptions.com. TDI has a lot of really great resources on their website, uh, videos and just information on what happens uh, for storm, how to prepare for a storm. FEMA, of course, uh, has a wealth of information. TWIA, if you live on the coast. GLO, if you wanna learn about their disaster aid uh, that they have available. Also, if you wanna learn about the Alamo or the other, but the Alamo is the only place that I can think of. So thanks, Krista, for that. Camille Garcia with the Insurance Council of Texas, a lot of great information there on on what, how insurance works, why it works, why it's important. Thank you again to everybody who joined us. We're gonna uh, let you get back to your afternoon uh, and hope you enjoy it. Bye-bye. Thanks.